when we drew a map of the incursions around Utah, whether it was you know, over near Nevada with the Nevada test site, whether it was the uranium mines along the San Juan River, whether it was the tar sands mine up in the Brook Cliffs, whether it was Mad Corps at Great Salt Lake, we drew, I drew a map of where he could photograph. About four months into it, he called me and he said, Terry, Utah is the most violent place I've ever been. And this, what I'm going to read to you, was a long extended text to him. What is beauty if not stillness? What is stillness if not sight? What is sight if not an awakening? What is an awakening if not now? The American landscape is under assault by an administration that cares only about themselves. Working behind closed doors, they are strategically undermining environmental protections that have been in place for decades, and they're getting away with it. In practices of secrecy, in deeds of greed, in acts of violence that are causing pain. Like many, I have compartmentalized my state of mind in order to survive. Like most, I have also compartmentalized my state of Utah. It is a violence hidden that we all share. This is the fallout that has entered our bodies, nuclear bombs tested in the desert, boom. These are uranium tailings left on the edges of our towns where children play, boom. The war games played and nerve gas stored in the West Desert, boom. These are the oil and gas lines, frack lines, from Vernal to Bonanza in the Uinta Basin, boom. This is Anna and Montezuma Creek, the oil patches and Indian lands, boom. Gut bear's ears, boom. Cut grand staircase Escalante in half, boom. In every other wild place that is easier for me to defend than my own people and species, boom. And the coal and copper mines I watched expand as a child, Huntington and Kennecott, boom. The oil refineries that foul the air and blacken our lungs in Salt Lake City, boom. And the latest scar on the landscape, the tar sands mine in the Brook Cliffs, closed now hidden simply by its remoteness, boom. Add the Cisco Desert where train stops and settle the radioactive waste they carry on to Blanding, Boom. Move the uranium tailings from Moab to Crescent Junction, then bury it still hot in the alkaline desert, out of sight, out of mind. Boom. See the traces of human indignities on the sands near Topaz Mountain, left by the Japanese internment camp. Boom. President Donald J. Trump will try to eviscerate Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante monuments with his pen and poisonous policies. He will stand tall with other white men who for generations have exhumed, looted, and profited from the graves of ancient ones. They will tell you Bears Ears belongs to them. Boom. Consider Orrin Hatch, former senator, his words regarding the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition's support of the Bears Ears National Monument. Quote, well, the Indians, they don't really fully understand a lot of things that they're currently taking for granted on those lands. They won't be able to do any of these things if it's made clearly into a monument or wilderness. But they don't understand, unquote. And when he was asked to give examples, the senator said to the press, just take my word for it. Boom. This is a story, a patronizing story, a condescending story. I see politicians and call them frontier Mormons discounting the tribes once again, calling them, quote, Lamanites, unquote, the rebellious ones against God, dark-skinned and cursed. That is their story. Racism is a story. The Book of Mormon is a story. Boom. Perhaps our greatest trauma living in the state of Utah is the religiosity of the Mormon patriarchy that says, you have no authority to speak. Women, Indians, black people, brown people, gay people, trans, it is only the chosen ones who hold the priesthood over us and counsel us that the only way to heaven is through them. All my life I was told I could not speak, that I had no voice, no power, except through my father, or husband, or bishop, or general authority, and then there was the prophet. Boom. I refused to perpetuate this lie, this myth, this abuse called silence. If 
birds had a voice, so did I. I would tell a different story, one of beauty and abundance, not what it means to endure. Environmental racism is the outcome of bad stories. A byproduct of poverty in Utah, yellow cake has dusted the lips of Navajo uranium workers for decades who are now sick or dead. Boom. There is no running water in Westwater, a reservation town adjacent to Blanding. Local municipalities refuse to provide Navajo families with a basic human right. Water. Boom. But we are not prejudiced. Boom. If you speak of these oversights, call them cruelties. We, as Mormons, I am a Mormon, are seen as having betrayed our roots and our people. These are my people. Boom. This is who I am. Boom. A white woman of privilege born of the covenant. I am not on the outside, but the inside. Boom. It is time to look in the mirror and reflect on the histories that are ours. We are being told a treacherous story that says it is an individual's right, our hallowed state's right, to destroy what is common to us all. The land beneath our feet, the water we drink, the air we breathe. Our bodies and the body of the state of Utah are being violated. Our eyes are closed, our mouths are sealed. We refuse to see or say what we know to be true. Utah is a beautiful violence. Do we dare to see Utah for what it is, an elegant, toxic landscape where the power of oppression rules by repression, our proving grounds of fear? What are we afraid of? Exposure. Boom. Our denial is our collusion. Our silence is our death. The climate is changing. We have a right and responsibility to protect each other. Resistance and insistence before the law. We are dying. My family has been dying. We are ignoring the evidence. You know the evidence. The evidence in our own bodies. Boom. Awareness is our prayer. Beauty will prevail. Native people are showing us the way. It is time to heal these lands and each other by calling them what they are. Sacred. May wing beats of raven cross over us in ceremony. May we recognize our need of a collective blessing by earth. May we ask forgiveness for our wounding of land and spirit. And may our right relationship to life be restored as we work together toward a survival shared, both human and wild. A story is awakening. Many stories are awakening. We are part of something so much larger than ourselves, an interconnected whole that stretches upward to the stars. Coyote in the desert is howling in the darkness, calling forth the pack, lifting up the moon. Taya, let's talk. Ms. Williams, who I have admired so much for so long as a writer, an activist, a truth teller, a human being. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, we're here to talk about many things. Writing as a personal and radical act. The way landscape shapes us. The way we shape landscape. The stories that keep us in balance and keep our society in seemingly endless cycles of natural destruction. But mostly, we're here to talk about erosion. Reading it, I was struck, as always, by the power and beauty of your language and sense of place, the urgency and directness with which you speak, with understanding and with hope to the rising fear and despair that many of us have felt for the past several years. Um, centering erosion around the ways that landscape is shaped by wind, water, and time, Terry breaks open the various ways the forces around people shape us, too. 
showing us that the way we live, not just as individuals, but as a society, is so fully trained on the present moment that we too easily allow ourselves to disregard the things that predate and should outlast us. Um, the question she poses that spoke most urgently to me, and will surely speak to so many of your fans who have joined us here tonight, is how do we find the strength to not look away from all that is breaking our hearts? Um, I'd like to start out by asking you a question with which Daisy Johnson surprised me at an event in, in London. Um, you spoke to some degree about, about your upbringing in, in the uh, in boom that you read from uh, Erosion. Would you mind starting out by telling us what were you like as a child and what was your relationship to landscape like as a child? Um, if my father was here, he's 86, he would say that I had every sign of me coming normal until I turned 14. So, and I think what he meant is that I was just like every boy until I became a girl. And um, my relationship to the land was my relationship to family. Uh, my family uh, runs gas lines. They've done a lot of work in Vegas. Um, it's fourth generation now. Uh, oil and gas. Um, water lines, sewage lines. Uh, so we've made our living off the land. And I can tell you our family conversations can be heated. Um, I remember in St. George, uh, our family was running a gas line through the Desert Tortoise Preserve. And Brooke and I, my husband, were fighting for the rights of the Desert Tortoise as my family business was being shut down by them. And I can tell you, it was not a pleasant Thanksgiving. <laughs> and uh, so I think my relationship to the land has always been about birds, about creatures, about walking the pipelines with my father, watching birds with my grandmother, um, watching deer with my brothers. It was body, skin, soul. And I would say took precedence over religion. Um, even as a, a traditional Mormon family. Thank you so much. Um, you've arranged erosion to bridge landscape and, and personhood. You talk not only about the erosion of land by both natural and exploitative forces, but about erosion of the self, of faith, of democracy. Uh, at the center of your query lies the 2016 presidential election and the very, very real acceleration of violations against the American Southwest landscape um, by an administration, as you said, with no regard for science and environmental protections. Can you talk a little bit about Bears Ears um, and the Grand Staircase Escalante Monument and what, what has happened there? And there's a real connection with Nevada and Gold Butte was part of the National Monuments that was under siege. Um, Native people where I come from in the Four Corners region have always viewed Bears Ears, there are two buttes um, in the Grand, uh, Grand Gulch area, just outside of Blanding, Utah, very near the Four Corners. They've always viewed that as a gathering place um, for not just Southwestern tribes, but for all tribes. And interestingly enough, in 1968, this was told to us by Mark Barry Boyd, who's been a county commissioner, Navajo. He was sitting on his grandmother's lap, 1968. Bobby Kennedy was running for office. If you can believe this, he went into Indian country, went to Monument Valley, met with the elders, and he said to them, how can I serve you? And the elders at that time said, help us protect Bears Ears. So this was not something new. This was not a last minute monument. This is something that the tribes have been working on for a long time. Um, as a traditional environmentalist, you know, we have not worked with the tribes. Um, and I'm embarrassed by that. And I think I've come of age of a conservationist through Bears Ears working with elders, working with the women of Bears Ears, working with these five other nations 
as an ally. And I think those of us working in Utah and around the country feel that we have learned something. How to talk less and serve more. Um, Bears Ears, 1.9 million acres was the established monument under President Obama on December 28th of 2016. It was a handshake across his street. He heard the tribes, he heard the coalition and said, um, we want to recognize this as sacred land. Established a monument with the promise that traditional knowledge would be joined, woven in with um, Western science and that the tribes would have equal say in how it was managed. Less than a year later, you'll remember here in Nevada, um, Pre uh, President Trump um, with Zinke, the Secretary of Interior, did a review of monuments from 1996 up to present. Any monuments that were made in those years, there were over 100,000. Goldview was one of them. And they would do a review uh, Goldview survived, um, and I think it's to the credit of, of the activists in Nevada, as well as a strong Senator Reid, and Utah did not, and I think that was at the hands of Orrin Hatch as a favor. And as I said, Bears was gutted by 85%. It is now open for business, uranium, coal, uh, oil and gas, and Grand Staircase Escalante, which was cutoff point at 1996, established by Clinton, was cut in half. Um, now it's in the courts, um, even as oil and gas leases are being sold. And we feel confident, the tribes feel confident. What's interesting is that it's not um, a strategy that we saw at Standing Rock of encampments and civil disobedience. Um, what we are learning from them is they are in prayer. They are in ceremony, and I'll never forget going down and talking to Willie Gray Eyes, who's now a county commissioner. I said, Willie, what do we do with our anger? And he said, Terry, it can no longer be about anger. It has to be about healing. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned that. In an, in an interview, you once said, we have to tr transcend our government and relate to each other as human beings first an American second, and feel both our local and global responsibility. No one lives in isolation anymore. Um, community plays such an important role in your work generally, and this book in particular. Can you talk a little bit about how you view our responsibilities to each other in this age? What a great question. Um, I hope so. <laughs> you know, I think it, the first thing that comes to my mind is how do we listen to one another? And I don't know about your family, but for our family, it's really beginning around the dinner table because we don't all agree. My uncle was a former state senator and he and my father, you know, I, one dinner party, dad said, you know, we were raised by the same parents. How could you vote for this president? And he looked at my father and said, John, Washington, Lincoln, Trump, and he walked out of the house. <laughs> and I don't mean to assume that we all share the same politics. Um, I have a point of view and I respect those who differ from me, and I do, and I love my uncle, and we have really great conversations. I was just down in Louisiana um, with a woman who is dying. Uh, I interviewed her, I met her, she ran a convenience store during the BP oil spill. Uh, it was midnight, I knocked on her door, I said, do you have a Twinkie? And she said, no, but what do you want? And I said, how about fish? And she said, we can go catch some. And we caught redfish. Um, what we didn't know then, that in Cajun country, she's a Cajun woman, every night from April till when the well stopped um, losing, you know, spilling, leaking, um, till August, the Coast Guard was spraying Cajun people with dispersants. They no longer have individual funerals, they have annual funerals. She has probably a year left. And we disagree politically. Um, but what 
do agree on is a sense of calling. And I think how do we serve one another in our communities with differences I think we miss them. And what we found that our, our meeting point was the long-legged bird. You know, that the birds I knew and know by name in the marshes of Great Salt Lake are the birds that migrate to the bayous. And that's, that's our meeting point. Um, so I think it's about listening. I think it's about understanding privilege and racism, um, even in our own state of Utah, especially in our state of Utah. And then I think as writers, Taya, you know, how do we tell a story that bypasses rhetoric and pierces the heart? And that's why I so admired what you've done in England. And can you, may I ask you a question? Sure. You know, <laughs> How did, how did you conceive your story that I think really asks us to consider a different kind of West, a communal West, that defies stereotypes? And what was your intent in terms of building community as a writer? Um, that's, a great, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, um, you know, I, I had grown up with, I was born in the former Yugoslavia, I, and, and I grew up with the Western as a, as, a, as a, you know, with the capital W. Um, and um, I, I think I had, when I, when I came here um, and began to learn about uh, how mythology rubs up against fact um, and true history, um, and the true histories that we don't face, and I certainly come from, from a country that doesn't face true history either, um, I, I wanted to explore some story uh, uh, that didn't present to me the things that I already knew to be myths. And uh, I found the story of the, of the Camel Corps, the United States Camel Corps, about which I had never heard, despite a lot of research that I had done uh, you know, on various um, immigrant projects throughout the American West. Uh, and it just struck me that the, the kind of West that, that I wanted to write about was about trying to find community and trying to find belonging despite the tremendous individual isolation of these people for whom the myth was, just wasn't working. Um, so yeah. Thank you for reading it. I'm just so honored and blown away. Well, and I was interested in reading one of your interviews. I think it was in The, the Guardian. And you said that when you came to the desert, you felt like you were home. Yeah. yeah. And that just made me so happy because I think so often people come, and maybe as Nevada do feel this, and you know, they come to where I, we live and they go, there's nothing here, yeah. you know? And case in point, not long ago we had a, a friend of ours say, oh, I have this new girlfriend, can I bring her to Castle Valley? I'd love for you to meet her. And we went, of course. They came, we had this wonderful dinner, we went on a beautiful walk, I just thought we were the greatest host and hostesses, you know, they were such a good time, and we, then I went to bed, and then in the middle of the night, when I thought it was the night, I heard this shuffling around, and the front of my robe went out, and his friend was packed, ready to go. <laughs> and it was five in the morning, and I said, are you okay? And she said, no. And I said, what's the matter? She goes, it's too quiet, it's too dark, it's too wild, it's too everything. <laughs> and I got to get up. And you know, our friend comes out disheveled and just said, Thanks, and, you know, <laughs> I guess we're going. Brooke comes, we walk them out in the door. By now, dawn starting to rise, and she rolled down her window and she said, Terry, aren't you afraid you're going to be forgotten? And I thought, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then they went away, and I thought, You know, is the desert an acquired taste? You know, is the West such a mythology that people can't see it for what it is or what it isn't? And then I thought, you know, no, I'm not afraid of being forgotten. What I'm afraid of is forgetting. Forgetting what stillness is. Forgetting what aridity means. I mean, the metaphor of water and the fact of water in your novel is stunning. Um, you just, do you know where that one passage is that is so stunning about where 
I think um, he's talking to Bert the camel and talks about what he wishes water would hold for people. Can you read that? Do I know where it is? Yes. It's the most beautiful passage. It's one of those where you just think, oh, sure. <laughs> um, while I find it, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I write fiction uh, mostly, and, and, and you write um, nonfiction. Um, and I wanted to, to ask you, well, while I search for this, but also in, in, in general, um, what you find that writing nonfiction affords you both as, a, as an artist and a person of, of um, spiritual practice? Let's wait for her to find her. <laughs> I do think writing is a spiritual practice. You know, even ritualistically, I can tell you, I always have, I always light a candle before I start writing, and I have a bowl of water. Now, one could say, in case you tip the candle over and the paper spills, I'm like, you can douse it, but that's not it. I feel like so much of my time sitting at my desk, nothing happens. But I notice day after day, no pages are being written, but the water's going down. So I know that evaporation is occurring, and that there must be some creative process that's going on in me. And I also, the, the, the minute I light that candle, I feel like the room is animated, and I feel like something is coming through me. And I don't really know what I think until I write it down. Do you feel that? For sure, I think that, you know, ideas and concepts are always swimming around in my head, but, but they never, um, they don't come out perfectly when I write them down, but, but, but they become concrete. And, and it's only then that I realize what it is I'm actually trying to say or what it is I believe about something. Um, yeah, it's like there's another force moving through you and you're just sort of caught with the, 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 you know, the wrist that moves the, the pencil and the ideas are loaded, they're preloaded somewhere else. Um, I mean, I'm in awe of fiction. Um, I think about you, this book, I think about Colin and his new book about Palestine and, and Israel, I think about the overstory and, and how we create other worlds of the world we've been given. Um, you ask, what does nonfiction afford to me? I'm in awe of this world. And, and, you know, I think the things that I write about, you couldn't make them up or people would say, that it's, it's always, always, that it's, yeah, yeah, that it's, it's contrived. Nine women in my family all had mastectomies, seven are dead. That's a fact. Um, the fact that half of my family is dead from cancer is a fact. Um, the Willie Gray Eyes, you know, who is one of the most powerful leaders I have ever seen. Um, Navajo, who lives at Navajo Mountain, sued the state of Utah, San Juan County, um, for racial gerrymandering. And then when this open space of democracy had been created, he knew he had to step inside. He ran for county commissioner, he won. Kelly Laws, his opponent, um, cried foul and said this is an illegitimate election by an illegitimate candidate. Willie Gray is not a citizen or resident of Utah. And they went to court by a, a newly appointed judge, um, Judge Torgerson from Donald Trump, um, in San Juan County. The courthouse was packed. There were only two Native people. The rest were Blanding Mormons and Fuzzle and I and Willie's grandson. We watched that trial. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. You could not make it up. And Willie's defense, he could have shown how many years of, the, of a driver's license, how many years of a voting record. Um, this is a man who lived in his car. His turquoise car is legendary. And the question they kept saying, where does Willie Gray Eyes live? What Willie Gray Eyes' defense was, I lived in Navajo Mountain. I am a resident of the state of Utah because my umbilical cord is buried here. When he said that, you can imagine the guffaws and laughter, eye rolling. By the time, because then when they went out to the 
looked at the quadrants he gave, there was no structure. That was where his umbilical cord was buried. At the last moment, um, they called his daughter, and she said, do you want to know where my father sleeps? My father sleeps on the land. Do you want to know where my father, why he was in Page, Arizona, because my mother died of the Iranian lions, and he lived with us for four years until we were old enough to take care of ourselves. And, and she said, Lily Gray Eyes lives on the Mother Earth. End of the trial. He won his case. And the newly appointed judge by Donald Trump said, if only all of us had a sense of dwelling and residency that Lily Gray Eyes, perhaps the United States of America would be more united. You know, you can't make that up. That could not be fiction because it would be called sentimental. And so that's what nonfiction. I feel like I'm, I'm simply a scribe to the world we're living in, um, that I'm bearing witness to a world that is more beautiful and more terrible than we can imagine. But, you know, you create other worlds. And this paragraph to me is why we read. I'll read it. I think I found it. I was hoping you had forgotten. Um, <laughs> um, thank you for thank you for, for being um, moved by this paragraph. Um, I hope I'm reading the correct one. This is um, this is the, the narrator Lurie. He's a, a Balkan immigrant who's, who's had his name Americanized, and he's joined up with the United States Camel Corps. And he's talking to his Camel Burke about the time they've they've spent together. Um, of over the years. Purple sunsets every once in a while silhouetted the thin smoke of Indian fires, but these were fewer now and always more distant. Here and there, the shore of the river was cross-hatched with wagon tracks. At the southern road crossing, we began ferrying water again, but our time in this pursuit was diminished too, for they were digging irrigation ditches everywhere. Now and again, it occurred to me that though I was only 30, I had gone the way of unbearable old men, talking all spring of the camel corps to Mormons and children and thin husks of pilgrims waiting on the new ferry, indeed to anyone who would accord me the time. The wide raft moved unendingly back and forth across the stream. The boys standing guard at the ramparts of the fledgling fort on the far shore were too young to remember the old emptiness of this place. The blue of distant mountains, the Mojave, those tall river people, the first and last men west of the Missouri ever to face down a camel cavalry, the first steamship to travel this length of the Colorado, rounding the crooked current with her wheel shining as it cut the water. But we remembered, you and I. It saddened me. Who would speak of these things when we were gone? So too must the makers of those distant fires have asked themselves as they fought the fading of their world. I began to wish that I could pour our memories into the water we carried so that anyone drinking might see how it had been. Questions, question papers that, that you were perhaps handed, and if you have filled them out, can you please um, pass them uh, to the end of your row or hold up your hand so that um, uh, the, the lovely people working here can collect them from you so that we can do the Q and A in just a couple more minutes? Um, they look like this. This person has amazing handwriting. <laughs> you know, one of the things about that it just made me think about the memory of water or all of our stories that are in that water and just I think that's one of the most beautiful passages to contemplate and I'm not going to spoil how the novel ends um, or where it progresses but it's I mean to me that's magic that that fiction is is alchemical and I'm wondering and this is a sincere question you know I've never lived anywhere else but the west I mean I've never lived outside of Utah or Wyoming for more than four months um, until just recently. But you have a global perspective. Um, you live in Manhattan and teach at Hunter College. You also, you know, love the West. 
living in Wyoming. What, what do you think the West has? You know, in, I mean, as Westerners, I think we're all, we doubt ourselves. Um, in many ways, we're invisible. Um, we know the struggle here. No one, you know, in Cambridge, Massachusetts knows what public lands are. In the state of Nevada, it's 84.6%. You know, in Utah, it's almost 70%. What would you tell us about ourselves? <laughs> and that's a serious question because you have, I think you're one of the few writers that really has a global perspective, having lived, breathed, and been in these other. Um, I grew up. I grew up in a in a, in a different uh, desert. I grew up in the Sahara. Uh, I when we when we left um, the former Yugoslavia during the war, we ended up in Egypt. Um, and I loved that desert too. Uh, I think what I would say is that I, I, I think that everything that the West has to offer at its heart is written about so beautifully in your books. And this isn't this isn't um, this isn't me sort of uh, 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 blowing smoke here because it's, it's it's an event between the two of us. But I but I think. It, it, um, I learned a word from a student of mine some years ago, hierophany. I never heard it before. Um, it is the point at, uh, on earth at which the divinity touches the ground. In, in, uh, in, sort of in Paleolithic uh, religions and then, and then um, uh, in, in early, in, in ancient uh, religions as well. And I, I remember thinking of that word when I first came. Uh, to the Mojave, especially. Um, I think there are places, like, like public, public lands are, are everything. It's the way the world was before we got here. It started to, um, started to turn the world toward ourselves. And these mandates you talk about, you know, um, even in, in, in Boom, which, which we have the benefit of, of hearing, um, and in the rest of this wonderful book, which you should definitely buy and read. Um, you talk about how our narratives are so entwined with, with the ruin that we permit ourselves to commit on the earth. And uh, that rugged individualism that you're talking about is so part and parcel with the way that we mythologize the West, but not necessarily with what it is, and the whole massive complex truth of it. The, the, um, the public lands, the tribal lands, uh, ancestral sites, the idea of something sacred really being here and predating all notions of story, I think is real. Um, and you feel it out here. Uh, and I wanted, to, I wanted to close out my uh, portion of asking you questions, and sort of hopefully allow, I, I don't hear those papers going around, but um, by asking you, well, about two things. I want to ask you about storytelling. If our storytelling traditions have helped bring us to the brink of ruin, can they save us? What are the stories that we should be telling ourselves and hearing and feeling and seeing and dreaming to get ourselves to the next phase of being human and being communal? What should our storytelling be from now on? Such a great question. Um, I mean, I think story is the umbilical cord between the past, present, and future. It keeps things known. You know, growing up in a Mormon household, one of the things I love most about my culture is we were raised on story. My grandmother was born in Mexico. You know, Pancho Villa was coming through. Um, my grandmother told us, and my great-grandmother, politely Romney, uh, they, they had one minute notice. She left a cake in the oven, you know, and they went back on horseback. My grandmother, two years old, my grand, great-grandmother was pregnant with MP. They rode to the border 
and in El, pa in El Paso they were refugees and given a one-way ticket by the federal government to return to the place of their heart and they came back to Utah. You know, as a child you heard that story and you immediately knew home was Utah. It transcended religion, it transcended everything and that that was where the safety was. That's how that translated to me. I think we have, as I said in Boone, um, racism is a story, a bad story, a, a hurtful story. And I think one of the most hopeful things is seeing the multiplicity of stories. We just had 25 women of bears ears at our home. And I listened for three days. I've never heard such powerful stories. And I think those stories will save us. And, and what they were saying, and I don't think they would mind if I said this, is, you know, protecting bears ears isn't, they kept saying, it isn't about us. Protecting bears is protecting all of us. So I think this multiplicity of stories, um, stories that are inclusive, not exclusive. Um, and stories of water. I mean, I think that's why it touched me so deeply. I mean, Las Vegas is a fantasy, right? To me, it's the ultimate. I have to be honest with you, I've not been here for 20 years. And I was here all the time during the test site years. But Brooke and I came 20 years ago, he had a nervous breakdown, and we went to Circus Soleil, and he'd been in the desert for nine months, and he literally had an anxiety attack. And I thought, what can I do? I'll take him to the Bellagio to see water dance. And that was worse. And I thought, oh, he loves Moreau, I'll take him to the art gallery in the Bellagio. And he went to touch it, and the alarm went off, and he was arrested. <laughs> and, um, and then finally I said, no, you don't understand, he's having a nervous breakdown, you know, we live in Castle Valley, in a town of 200 people, this is too much. And he goes, I know exactly what you mean. And he took us up to the room, we put Brooke to bed, um, we haven't been back since. <laughs> and now we're staying in the Venetian. The um, but it's a fantasy, but water is not. And I think about, you know, if water holds all our stories, as you suggest, What's happening to Las Vegas? What's happening to Lake Mead? What's happening to all the fracked water? What's happening to all the uranium poisoned water? What's happening to our stories? So I think it's all interconnected, interrelated. And I think that's why we were Yeah, Yeah, I have time for, for a few of them. Oh, that is gone. Three. Oh, three. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to start with this question. Uh, this is from a 14-year-old member of the audience, and they say, what can young people do to help conserve and have a voice? What would I say? Um, I think that, that one of the great things about young people now is that they listen to each other certainly more than we did when I was young. You know, um, I think they've been they've been brought up in a world um, in which they listen to each other and which they are fearless about free speech in a way that uh, that seems impossible to put back in the bottle. And I think that's an amazing weapon. Um, what do you think? And I think there are teachers right now. You know, I look at the climate movement and the youth movement, and fearless is the word. I also think there's a lot of anxiety, and I think it's really important that, that we have an intergenerational conversation, um, and that we listen to the 14-year-olds, and that, that we can be there to support them in, in what they're doing. I also think they're equipped to handle this moment. And I think whether it's Greta or I look at Stephen Kelly's um, son and Wyatt, you know, they're incredibly gentle. And I see the young people that I'm working with as pragmatic visionaries. Um, they're not sentimental, they're not soft. 
they haven't been spared um, idealism. You know, I mean, they see what's happening, and and I I have tremendous faith in them. Um, And again, I think we have to listen and open doors. And, and, and I think too that they're not as, um, I think my generation was very bound up in the promises of the past. You know, you, you sort of believe that the world is going to function a particular way if it functioned this way. In your parents' lifetime, it will function, hopefully, in, this, in along similar patterns. And the young, I think, um, are, have been broken of that illusion, but that's a great and freeing thing. You know, you aren't trying to follow some pattern that entitles you to a particular path of life. You're just trying to carve a whole, oh gosh, now I'm going to say the words, a whole new world, which I didn't mean to, but I, <laughs> a whole new reality. <laughs> but I also think we can't lie yeah. to them. You know, I remember watching. Stephen and Wyatt with my father. That would be their great grandfather. And he was reading to them a picture book about ice and glaciers. And ultimately it was about climate change. And that was the first time Stephen, I think he was six, heard that word. And when he said, John, what does climate change mean? And my father had been a climate denier. And then Jim Baylock, that film, really changed my father. And he told, that was a story. And I, I remember Dad saying, you know, I grew up with an old story, that those glaciers would be forever. You are now watching a new story. Those glaciers are melting, like in Jackson Hole. And I thought, here's an intergenerational conversation, and he's not lying to them. And Stephen said, you know, what does that mean? What will we see? And Dad said, I don't know. And I haven't had that conversation with Stephen, but I think... You know, to have those kinds of honest conversations. Um, yeah, that's a wonderful thing that they demand of us, too, I think. Um, I have a second question for you. Um, how do you know when you want to write about something? How do you find your subjects? This actually dovetails with one of the questions that I, that I, that I failed to ask you, which was, do you... With erosion, for instance, did you know that it was going to be, that, that, that the unifying theme of it would be erosion? I know you wrote the essays over, over a period of many, many years. Did you just find yourself producing essays that all led back to it, or did you deliberately steer the ship toward the theme? We live in an erosional landscape, and I don't see, erosion is complicated to me. Erosion is, is both beauty and Weather, you know, like you said, um, through wind, water, and time. But I also, when Donald Trump won the election, um, I wrote a piece just in my journal called Erosion. And I think that's when this book began. An erosion of democracy, and from my point of view, an erosion of decency, um, an erosion of self. I was fired from my job at the University of Utah um, because of a political action of Brooke and I buying oil and gas leases as a protest, saying we will not um, develop these leases until science can show us the, the natural gas is worth more above ground than below, given the cost of climate. Um, and then what I didn't know, and I don't know about you, but the ultimate erosion for me was uh, if I'm telling the truth, um, my brother, my brother uh, is dead by suicide um, a year and a half ago. And, you know, that's an erosion of, a, of another kind. Um, he hung himself, and they found him on his knees. And when I heard that Dan had 
taking this life. My first reaction was um, I felt it was an act of courage and that, that the gesture of, of being on his knees that, that on some level there was an act of faith that there was something beyond. And we had had many, many conversations about that. And in fact, the truth is, and I didn't realize this until I went back to our texts, and you ask the question is, you know, when do you know, what, why do you write? I think one of the most important essays I've written is in this book called um, A Beautiful Rugged Place. And it's about Dennis' death. And more importantly, um, you know, there was a point he called me and he said, I have the rope. Um, I'm eroding. And I think this idea that we are both eroding and evolving at once. And I think, and I will share this, and I hadn't planned on it, but you know, my youngest brother, my remaining brother, Hank had made a commitment to Dan that he would see him through the cre cremation. I didn't know this. I knew Dan said to me, I've been buried too long, I need to fly. He, in his brighter moments, was a raptor rehabilitator. He was out in um, Nevada and Utah in the West Desert in the Great Basin, banding eagles and would talk about how it took, would take three people to bring in a golden eagle, um, a peregrine falcon, the migrations that would occur on the Great Basin. But his favorite bird was a, a red-tailed hawk because it was the one bird that Gilda that trusted. Um, we went to the mortuary. Um, we asked to see his body. Um, they're not equipped to have families engage. Truth was, uh, they said he's covered in plastic. We said, remove the plastic. They said it will take time. We said that's all we had. We went, we saw his body. We um, blessed his body in our tradition. Uh, and then there was a man named Mr. Rabe who dressed in a black suit, clearly LDS. This was his mission. This was his calling. And we asked if we could participate. And he let us. And we watched the crematorium go from 400 degrees to 1100 degrees, natural gas, the same natural gas that Dan had spent much of his life um, putting in the ground so homes could be heated. Um, we lifted his body and placed the body into the, the retort. Um, we waited three hours. Mr. Rabe came back and said, you may not want to stay here. I'm going to um, spread the bones. We watched the door open. We saw Dan in a cage that looked like Tibetan prayer flags. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It looked like Icarus with wings. We watched Mr. Rabe with welder's gloves, um, which is my other brother's profession, um, break the bones, distribute the bones, move the bones closed the retort. We waited another three hours. He opened the door and said, you may not want to be here. Hank said, we've made a commitment. He opened the door, gone. It, in that moment, it felt like Daniel's spirit. Again, he brought in the bones. We recognized the bones. He put the bones on two trays. We felt the last heat of our brother's body in those bones. We watched this man in this black suit. He looked like a Zen monk um, in a beautiful dance of meditation. We followed him in with these trays of bones. He left us there alone with our brother's bones. And I remember looking at Hank and saying, what are you thinking? And he said, probably the same thing you're thinking. Are they coyote, rabbit, or raven? <laughs> And you realize in that moment there is no hierarchy in death. That the years that we had followed the trenches as children with the laying of pipe, you know, how many bleached bones did we see in the desert, even now? And Mr. Robbie came back 
and we watched him separate the bones. It was like coral, it was like shells, it was like sand. And then again he said, do you want to stay to grind the bones? And in 57 seconds, our brother's bones were ash. And again he said, do you want to feel the last heat of your brother's life? And we did. And then he poured it into a black cardboard box that Dan would take into the desert on the edge of Utah and Nevada where Dan had abandoned those birds. We took that story. Dan's ashes were eight pounds, four ounces, the same weight of when he was born. The same weight of a gallon of water in the freezer. And when Hank took those fat Dan ashes up into the mountains, in the Cedar Mountains, Mr. Rabe said, before you go, it's been my experience, there's usually a sign. And as Hank took those ashes of his brother, our brother Dan, up into the top of that peak, he saw this configuration that looked like the head of an eagle. And that's where he, he laid Dan's ashes. And as you could not in fiction say, he heard a hawk. Couldn't see it, the sun was there. He heard the hawk, and he knew it was a red tip. One body yielding to another. These are the stories of our lives. And in, in writing that story, I felt like it was a healing. That as Willie said, it can no longer be about anger, it has to be about healing. And again, I think that's why we write. Inimitable Terry Cooks. <laughs>